by the enemy, the nation of Babylon. The city was destroyed. The temple was destroyed. Daniel and his friends were taken captive into a strange land. And they were serving their God in a pagan environment. Daniel was destined for leadership. Even the pagans could see that the hand of God was upon him. He had rare abilities and qualities of leadership. So they put him in a leadership program. But they said, in essence, you're going to have to follow our rules. If you want to rise in our society, you're going to have to do things our way. And Daniel and his friends said, in essence, in response, there are a lot of things we can do. We'll cooperate with your program. But when it comes to our convictions, when it comes to our commitment with God, our covenant with God, what God has instructed the Jewish people to do, we cannot compromise that. We refuse to compromise. We have certain dietary laws that God has given us. That's a sign of being a Jew. That's a sign of our covenant. And we will not change that. If you'll allow us to follow our God, you'll see that we're even more blessed than if we followed your plan. And it was so. Daniel rose to a high position of leadership. By the time of this story, he's an old man. And he served many years in the Babylonian government and later in the Persian government. I just want to take a moment to say this. We can have an influence in our society. This church can make a difference in the city of Eureka and come to the attention of the city. We need Pentecostals in every area of society. We need Pentecostal electricians, Pentecostal construction workers, Pentecostal engineers, Pentecostal bankers, doctors, lawyers, school teachers, civic servants, whatever occupation you can think of. We need apostolic Pentecostal people in our society, in our community. Interestingly, this last week in the country of Myanmar, formerly known as Burma, one of our members was elected as vice president of the country. There are two vice presidents. He's one of the two vice presidents. That's your United Pentecostal Church. They've just transitioned to democracy, and this is a brand new uh, position, and God has favored one of our own men. In fact, he's the son-in-law of our national superintendent, Brother Bai, of the country of Burma, Myanmar. So we can have an influence in our society. But we don't have to compromise our convictions to do so. In fact, we had better not compromise our convictions. We need to be who God has called us to be. We are Jesus' men. We're spirit filled. We're tongue talking. We're holiness. We believe in holiness on the inside, holiness in our relationship, holiness on the outside, in our dress, our speech. We are in the world, but we are not of the world. You can influence the world. You can make friends. You can be kind. You can be helpful. But you can still be identifiable as an apostolic, homeless wow. believer. That's the way we have to do this. Not by becoming the world, but by transforming the world. The way you grow a church is not by imitating what the world thinks a church ought to be. Right. Yes, we want to be very presentable to the world. We want to make a good impression on our website. We want to make a good impression when they come into our building, when we sing songs. We want to sing with excellence as we've done tonight. But we're not trying to please the world. We expect that when people come here, there may be some things they don't understand, they don't agree with, they don't like, they may be a little upset or troubled, but we're counting on God to move and touch their heart. And they may say, well, I don't agree with this or that, or I don't understand this or that, or this is not the way I understand religion is supposed to be. And then say, but I feel something I've never felt before. And look at those children, they're responding. Look at those young people, they're responding. There's something real here. We're counting on transformation. God will touch a lot and change a lot. Praise God. So Daniel was a witness in a pagan society. God blessed him and he did amazing things. But he had certain enemies. They were jealous of him and they sought some way to destroy him. They tracked him and they tried to find any means by which they could find some fault. They thought surely he must have some skeleton in the closet. He must be taking bribes. He must be skimming money off the government. He must be doing something. 
Because that's what they would do had they been in that position. But they could not find anything he was doing wrong. The only thing they could find on him, he consistently served his God. He was known as a man of prayer. A man who consistently and faithfully worshipped God. And so they went to the king with a scheme that they flattered the king. He didn't realize what was going on. So they said, oh, king, you're so wonderful. You do everything that we need. Please issue a decree that for the next 30 days, no one can make a petition of any other person or even of any God except for you. Outlaw prayer for 30 days. The king was so flattered that he agreed without understanding the consequences. When Daniel got the news of the new law out, outlawing prayer, what do you think he did? He didn't protest. He didn't go in the streets. He didn't file a lawsuit. He wasn't obnoxious. He didn't beat people up. He just did what he always did. He prayed. At the normal time, he prayed. Now, it's very interesting. He could have easily justified a 30-day moratorium on prayer. He could have said, now God, you spent all these years putting me into position. I know you don't want me to kill now or lose all the influence. And if I, if I don't pray for 30 days, I won't backslide. You know, if I skip church for 30 days, I, I'll still be saved. So uh, you'll understand. You won't hear from me for 30 days, but I'll be back. So don't worry about it. He could have easily justified. Or he could have said, now Lord, you can read my thoughts. You know my mind. I'm just going to be silent for 30 days. As I go about my business, I'll just be sending prayers to you. You'll know it. Nobody else will. But that's all that counts. You'll know it. I'll still be praying. But Daniel didn't take that route either. He thought, in other words, why compromise on anything? I'm just going to keep doing what I always do. I'm going to worship God the way I always worship God. You know, you might be tempted to say, well, let's just tone down the worship a while. We don't want to get too out of hand. We've got some prominent visitors. We don't want them to get the wrong impression. You know what? Don't be obnoxious, but just do what you're supposed to do. Go ahead and speak in tongues. Go ahead and dance to the Spirit. Go ahead and worship God. Go ahead and have intercession of prayer. Go ahead and pray on the altar. Go ahead and pray for someone to receive the Holy Spirit. Amen. And so Daniel prayed. And sure enough, he was arrested. The king was very sorrowful. He didn't intend this. And if you read the story, he even tried to cheer Daniel up by saying, Daniel, it'll be all right. Your, your God will take care of you. It wasn't really a statement of faith because when it really came to the test, he didn't have faith. He was lamenting and fearing the worst. He was just trying to make Daniel feel good. I don't know if he thought that maybe... On the way to the lion's den, maybe the Lord would send an army to rescue him. Or I don't know if he had any thought in mind, but it would be what I call a positive confession. You know, there are a lot of people that will make positive statements about God, but that doesn't amount to faith. There are a lot of churches that have built uh, great congregations and crowds by preaching a positive message of success and how to, how to have a positive attitude and succeed in, in the world. And, and that's good as far as it goes. I believe that if you have a positive attitude, you'll do more than if you have a negative attitude. That's true. Right. That's but that's not the same as faith. Right. There's some situations in life you come into a, a place where you need more than a positive attitude. You need more than a confession. You're hitting your head up against a brick wall. And no matter what you say in a positive way, that wall doesn't move. You need a miracle. You need God. You need God to do the impossible. And so our church is not just built on a positive attitude of success. Our church is built on things like repentance from sin. Our church is built on a message. You've got to change your way of life. It's built on commitment. It's built on a transformation, a new birth experience that will change your life, a new way of holiness. The churches of the world don't like to talk about repentance. They don't like to talk about holiness. They don't like to talk about commitment because it's all just a positive attitude. But our world needs more than a positive attitude. People can deny the existence of sin. They can say the things that they're doing aren't sin anymore. But 
I want you to know, sin still causes the same consequences that it's always caused. So that's why people are messed up and mixed up. Lives are torn apart because they convince themselves that their choices are okay. That every way of life is okay. Every choice is okay. But what they fail to realize, the consequences are still there. And so they get desperate. And they say, what's the answer? I don't understand. And there needs to be a church that says, we have a God who can forgive you of sin. We have a God who can help you change your way of life. We have a God who will show you the right way to live. And then he'll give you the power to fulfill it. Whatever God asks you to do, he'll give you they want to know, is there really a God? And if there is a God, does he care about me? And even if he does care about me, can he do anything about my situation? And they need a church that can stand up and say, yes, God is me. God can heal. God can deliver. God can forgive. God can set the captives free. God can give you a new beginning. Grace is more than sufficient for whatever the need because our God is able. Hallelujah. We need to be a church that's known in the community as a church of miracles. I remember when I was pastoring in Austin, Texas some years ago, my wife and I started a church there. 1992, we pastored 18 years until I was elected general superintendent and had to resign the church. And we started 16 daughter works out of that church um, in that time period as well. And we saw the church grow from literally our living room to a rented building for four years to our first building, our second building. And then when I was elected, we were in the process of moving to the freeway. The church has since done that under Pastor Shaw. Twelve acres of land, 100,000 square feet on the freeway, about 1,000 members, and, and 60,000 cars pass twice each day. So the whole city knows the church is there. And I think that's what God wants the church to be. Now, there are churches of all sizes, and each situation is different. But what I'm saying, we should expect the miraculous. We should expect God to move. We need to have a reputation in our community as that's a place where you can receive a miracle. That's a place where your life can be changed. That's a place where people know how to pray. They know how to touch God. I remember one time we received a call on the church answering machine. And in essence, a man said, I think my son is demon-possessed, and I need someone who knows something about demons that can help my son. I called him back. We set up an appointment. We ended up going over to his house and praying for his son and so forth. He said, I called many churches, but no one would return the call. He probably didn't, want, didn't know what they were, they were worried about, what they might get involved with. I'm not sure. But anyway, he said, finally, a friend of ours said, why don't you try the Pentecostals? They know how to deal with situations like this. And the long story short, his whole family is in the church, baptizing the family, including the son that he got prayed for. It took 10 years, but just last year, God filled him with the Holy Ghost. God can work. I've told you some of the testimonies that are around the world. Do you know in the Middle East, we have thousands of believers. Some of them are in countries where it's illegal to convert to Christianity. We have some missionaries that we do not advertise because they are in countries where they could be executed. They could be imprisoned if it were known what they were doing. So in some countries, we're allowed to operate openly. In some countries, we're allowed to operate only with people who already are Christians, say guest workers from other countries. Some countries, we strictly work underground. Some people are converted because we have messages over the internet in their language. And some of them are repenting of their sins and receiving the Holy Ghost in the privacy of their home while they're watching a service on the internet. Amen. Praise God. Some of them 
When they want to get baptized, they contact us and we instruct them to take their vacation, go to a neighboring country where they, we can operate legally to contact our churches. We have people that speak their language. We will baptize them in Jesus' name. If they haven't received the Holy Ghost, we will lay hands on them to receive the Holy Ghost and we will send them back into their home country. We had a thousand converts in the Middle East last year by means including those people. When you read the stories of the headlines, what you don't see is there's a United Pentecostal pastor and a United Pentecostal church behind the story. You, you've read about ISIS going into northern Iraq and conquering the city of Mosul and establishing uh, their territory. What you don't know is we had a United Pentecostal pastor in the city of Mosul. We had to use Compassion Services International Fund to smuggle him out of the city before ISIS could identify who he was. That's your fellow United Pentecostal believer right there in Iraq. And God is working in the midst of that. Some years ago, you read about the big earthquakes in Haiti. We have 50,000 believers in Haiti. We have 500 churches. We were the first responders on the scene because other entities had to organize and find workers that they could trust. We already had hundreds of churches in all those communities. We could directly send food and clothing and medical supplies because the church was there. You read about a couple of years ago the Ebola virus in Liberia that killed so many people. We have 100,000 believers in Liberia. We have a medical clinic there. Again, we were able to get supplies to remote villages that were cut off because we had contact. We were able to supply humanitarian needs as well as spiritual needs at the same time. I'm saying God is working in ways you can see, but God is working in ways you cannot see. God is working behind the scenes in the Middle East. God is working behind the scenes to restore, to heal, to deliver. Praise God. Some testimonies we can tell you. Other testimonies we can't even tell you. But I want you to know that God is able. God is working in communist countries right now. God is working from behind places like China. I can't even tell you the stories of that. I can tell you I've been there. You've been there. We've been part of it. But we don't even want to divulge the methods. But I do want you to know. I've received emails from that country saying, just wanted you to know, Brother Bernard, we, we started so many. Uh, you know, they will say, like, we started two or three new uh, uh, business centers. And the boss is very pleased. We took 15 people swimming last week and had a great time. And then they say, we stopped off at Joel's place and five people got drunk at Joel's place. We drank water at Joel's place.
is able. God is able. Think bigger than you're thinking about. Because God is able. I know it's one step at a time. But be thankful, but don't be satisfied. Be thankful for this building, but do not be satisfied with this building. Be thankful with the revival you have, but do not be satisfied with the revival you have. Because God is able. The king came to the den of lies, fearing the horse. Oh, Daniel, are you still alive? Was your God really able to help you out? And, the, and Daniel answered him, Oh, king, live forever. My God has delivered me from the lies. Oh, king, you're worried about me. Don't worry about me, I'm worried about you. I hope you live forever, O King. You could die any day of a heart attack. My God's taking care of me. So whatever happens to me, I, I'm, I'm okay with that because God's in control. But you're the one I'm worried about. I'm praying for you. Daniel came out of that den of wines. The Bible says he was not hurt in any manner. No scratch. You know, if the lions had attacked him and started, you know, destroying him and he was somehow able to, to clamber up them. I, I think of a, maybe a stone wall. He was able to lunge in the opposite corner and, and find a, a toehold and a foothold and, and scramble up there and dangle just out of reach and yet he's bleeding and maybe a toe eaten off and, and, and maybe severely scratched and he survived the night. He would say that's a miracle. But what God had was better than that. God brought him out whole again. It's like the three young Hebrews thrown into the furnace of fire. They were bound with ropes. They were thrown in the fire. What happened? The ropes were burned off, but they were untouched. When they came out of the fire, the Bible specifically says, no hair of their head was singed, none of their clothing was scorched, and there was no smell of smoke. The only thing that was destroyed were the things that were binding them and holding them back. No sign of smoke. What's so significant about that? We were on a missions trip one time and I got the call that our house caught on fire. And uh, fortunately they were able to salvage the house before it was destroyed. But you know what? Every room, even that where it wasn't burned, there was a smell of smoke. We had to get rid of furnishings and draperies. Even though they were preserved, you couldn't get the smell of smoke out. You know, there's some people like that in church. That they have been hurt. And maybe their, their concern is legitimate. Maybe they really were abused by someone as a child. Or, or by a spouse. Or sometimes even in church they were mistreated or abused. But even though that happened 10 years ago or 20 years ago, when you talk to them in a few minutes, you, you still sense that because they've never gotten over it. They're still wounded. They still have a grievance. They still can't trust leadership. They still can't have a relationship. They can't get over that. That's not the will of God. The original wound may have been a truly a wound, and it may not have been their fault, but God has a better future than for someone to be forever bound, forever a victim, forever wounded. God wants to heal and deliver. There are other people, you see them rejoicing, you see them worshiping, dancing, and you say, well, they, they probably never had a care in the world. You know, there's no way they could be doing all that stuff if they really went through what I went through. But some of those people that I'm pastoring, I remember a lady that loved to worship God. You would not know that she was on crack cocaine. And she came to church three times for deliverance and fell back each time. But finally she came, and this time she stuck. And now she's a model saint, and she worships God. You would never know that she wasn't raised in church. But that's because she doesn't have a smell of smoke. You would never know standing next to her, praising the Lord. Some people are on bitter divorces. Some people are on horrible betrayals. 
Some people have, have gone through all kinds of situations, but you would never know it because when you stand next to them, all they can do is worship God and praise Him. There's not even a smell of smoke. You say, can God really do that? Can God really change my past? Can God really take away that pain and agony? Yes, God is able. God can change your past. God can deliver you. God can set you free. God can heal the broken heart. God can give you a new beginning. God can give you a new life. Yes, God is able. God is able. God is able. Who am I talking to tonight? You know that you can never get over it. I'm here to say, you might always remember that incident or that event, but you can move past the past. You can. can move past the agony and do the will of God, and God can use you in turn to minister to others. God is able to set you free. God is able to give you a new life. God is able. I'm thinking of the Apostle Paul in jail. He's pacing back and forth. He's writing, he's dictating a letter. So it's almost like preaching to the church of Ephesus. And he's praying a prayer. Now unto him that is evil. He's thinking, I might be confined in this cell. Don't worry about that. God's able to do whatever he needs to do. I might be here right now, but the gospel is going forth. I'm in God's hands. You're in God's hands. What you need to remember is God is able. He says God is able to do an act of God. He's, he's able to do. He's able to act. But not just typical actions that you might think. God is able to do exceeding. And then I imagine the anointing starts to flow. He is a Pentecostal preacher after all. He starts getting beside himself. He starts grasping for more words. Now him is able to do exceeding. But that, that's not enough. That doesn't exhaust God's capability. What can I add to that? He is able to do exceeding abundantly. So what God does is abundant. We want showers of blessings. We want the Lord to fill our cup. God wants to pour out the Holy Ghost. He wants a mighty deluge of the Spirit. Now to Him that is able to do and see abundantly. What can I add to that? Above. He goes above. And then He's, he's still saying, I need something else. How, how can I explain the greatness of God? How can I explain what God can really do in your life? How can I explain the miracle that can take place in your church? He is able to do exceeding abundantly above all. That covers a whole lot. That covers it all. But he's still not finished. How can I add to all? Well, he says, above all that you ask or think. You know, sometimes we go to God in prayer with our laundry list or our grocery list. Now, Lord, if you'll just give me a raise in my job, I can take care of everything. Lord, if you'll just straighten out my wife or my husband or my son, then I can handle it from there. I just need you to straighten them out. God, if you'll just do this, if you'll just do that. But sometimes in the situation, it's so big, we don't even know what to tell God to do. And you know, God's okay with that. Even if you don't know what to tell him, he knows. He can do above all that you can ask or think. In other words, God can blow your mind. Don't limit God to your box. You know, I know we have an ordered service and we prepare, but don't limit God to what we've got planned. Sometimes the Lord begins to move in the service and I can tell the visitor looking around, I say, look, we need a God of the miraculous. The kind of problems we have, we don't need an ordinary God. We don't need an average God. If, if we had a God who only did what we knew, how can he fix anything? If all God could do was what we know to tell him, there's not much he could fix. 
We need a God that can do what we don't know to do. But when we have a God like that, sometimes He works outside of our little box. Sometimes He's not limited to our little schedule. Sometimes He might do something unusual or uncomfortable. You better let God be God. You better let God do what He wants to do. Because the kind of God we need is a God who can do the miraculous. A God who can do the unknowable, the unthinkable, the impossible. The God who is able. And so Paul said, and here's the best part of all, according to the power that works in us. The power that spoke the world into existence when there was nothing. God said, let there be light. And suddenly, light burst in the darkness. The astronomers say it was the Big Bang. Who banged the Big Bang? It was God. The God who can do that can speak into your life and dispel darkness. The God who did that could speak in your life and create something new. He is working in us. He is working in our church. He's working in this building. He works with you on your job. He works with you at school. God is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask of Him according to the power that works in us. Oh, let's stand right now. over this building in just a moment. I know God has already worked in this building, but there is something special about dedicating not only the place, but ourselves. But I think right now, whatever needs are in this building, personally, whatever needs are in your family, whatever needs are in your church, looks like you got a great church. I don't really know the situations, but I know their needs. There gotta be. But what if right now we would say God is able? In this night when we're dedicating this new building, we want God to confirm the word with signs followed. We want God to show up and to act and to do. We want a miracle. Not just for display sake, but because there are real needs of real people. And if this church is to fulfill the will of God, it needs more than our ability. It needs the miraculous touch of Almighty God as never before. We need bigger miracles than we've ever needed. A bigger church, the difference between a small church and a big church, a bigger church needs bigger miracles. And that's where you are. You're going to have to have bigger miracles than you've ever had before. Financially and every other way. You need God to do amazing things. So right now, before we go any further, what does God need to do in your life? Or what would you like God to do in your situation? I want us to call upon the Lord right now. I want us to open our heart in prayer. We'll have an opportunity to respond more later. But I'm here to preach to you. God is able. God is here to do mighty works in our midst. He can heal. He can deliver. Would you call upon him right now? Somebody can receive the Holy Ghost tonight. Somebody can be healed tonight. Somebody can receive an answer to prayer tonight. Somebody who's not even here. God can touch them tonight and work a miracle. Would you call out on the Lord to the Lord right now? Would you cry out to Him for your needs? Would you cry out to Him 